Um, okay, so uh, we're going to be talking about um, where those seven countries came from. So this is just a little bit of history. Um, so in 2014, in Bowling Green, Kentucky, um, there were two Iraqi refugees who the FBI um, got word that these were bad guys right, that they were interested in terrorism, that they had links to terrorism. And so the FBI sent um, a, like an undercover person to pretend to be like a fellow terrorist um, to try to get these guys to talk. And they do. Um, so the guy, the, the, the undercover person says that they're about to go back to Iraq and that they want um, advice and help to like develop ways to kill American soldiers in Iraq. And so these two Iraqi refugees, they provide, they help this undercover guy, you know, they think he's actually a terrorist. They help him, they get him a whole bunch of materials that he can use to help make explosives. They explicitly teach him how to make IEDs and improvised explosive devices, you know, that um, do so much damage to our troops in Iraq. Um, and then while they're talking, they reveal to this undercover guy that while, that when they were in Iraq, they actually helped kill Americans, like that they fought against Americans. One of them was a sniper in a roof that like shot at American soldiers who were going through this square, like that they are definitely bad dudes, right? These guys should not have been brought in as refugees. They are not refugees. They lied. Um, bad guys. So the FBI apprehends them, right? They get enough evidence and they apprehend them. They're charged with all of these um, uh, like crimes against the country. Uh, in the end, they're going to be punished and then deported. Like uh, that's whatever it is. There was a little of a misstep. You may have heard in the news about the Bowling Green Massacre. Um, Kellyanne Conway, one of President Trump's advisors, w was talking to a news network and she was like, well, we need this executive order to prevent another Bowling Green massacre. There was no Bowling Green massacre. They didn't actually kill anybody in the United States. Um, it was, they were, they couldn't, you know, and, and they didn't suggest, they didn't have any evidence of like trying to kill people in the United States. It was all, they were trying to like help fight the U.S. in Iraq. So they were trying to kill Americans in Iraq. They're definitely not good guys, but there was no like, event in the United States that killed anybody. So anyway, that was sort of a little bit of a misspeak or whatever. She apologized, Kelly and Conway apologized. Um, but so after this, in 2015, um, Congress is going to pass a new law that amends, that is changes, um, the visa waiver program. So anybody know what a visa is? It's not the credit card. But it is temporary. Allows you to come in the country. So, like, if I wanted to travel to the Ukraine, you know, I wanted to go as a tourist and see what was there. Well, obviously, I have to have a passport, right? But more than that, I have to have a visa. That means I have to get permission from the Ukrainian government to come. And there are all kinds of visas. I would be applying for a tourist visa if I wanted to go and study in, you know, like um, Moscow's university, whatever it's called. Um, I have to get a, you know, a student visa. Or whatever. So I had to get a visa. So what, the visa process usually takes um, like six weeks to two or three months. It's a, it's a long process. You have to apply, and then they send you back some paperwork to fill out, and then they like do background checks about you. They decide do they actually want you in their country, and then they send that information back, and then they're going to send you um, like ask more information about when you want to travel, and then finally you get this visa, right? So a visa is temporary permission to go to a country. It you're not an immigrant. Um, but there's all kinds of visas. There are tourist visas, there are work visas, so you can get a work visa like you have permission to come to this country for five years to work, or six months to work, or whatever it is. Um, there are student visas, you have permission to come to this country to be a student, whatever it is. And if I have a visa, so let's say that I wanted to go to whatever, Moscow University or something, and I get a student visa, right, so I'm allowed for four years to study at Moscow University. While I have that visa, can I leave the country of Russia? Yes, right? I can come home for Christmas um, and visit my family, and then I can go back. And so long as that visa is valid, right, it said four years, then I have this free travel between the countries. Now, your husband, if you're with me about what a visa is. Okay, but you probably also know that if you wanted to go to visit, like, um, Canada or Mexico or England, do you need a visa to go there? No, you do need a passport, right? To show that your passport it proves that you're a U.S. citizen. They're going to stamp it in every country you go to, like, show that you've been there or whatever. But you don't need a visa. I don't have to get permission from the Canadian government to go to Canada um, as a U.S. citizen. I just go with my passport. 
The same thing is true of people coming here. So if you're an England, if you're a British citizen, you have a British passport, and you want to come to the U.S. to be a student or to um, or to, to be a tourist or whatever, you don't need a visa. They're part of the so-called visa waiver program. Right? They don't have to have a visa, right? A waiver. They don't have to have it. They can just come and then they go, and it's fine because our countries have a special relationship. And you can imagine why we have visa waiver programs, right? If every time anyone ever wanted to travel between, let's say, Britain and the United States, they had to get a visa, think of how much harder it would be to do business, right, between the two countries. We have lots of people who go back and forth all the time, right, on business, going to meetings, doing research, trying to buy in real estate. So to make that process, to make, you know, economics easier, we don't want them to have to get a visa every time. But so back to the, what happened in Congress. So Congress in 2015, largely in response to this, like, kind of scary situation in Bowling Green, Kentucky, right? Oh my gosh, we let in as refugees two really bad terrorist guys, you know, who want to kill Americans. They changed the visa waiver program and said that anyone who is a citizen of those seven countries or has recently traveled to those seven countries, they, even if they have a passport from one of our visa waiver friends, even if they have a British passport, if they're actually dual citizens in Iraq, or if they've recently been to Iraq, they're going to have to get a visa. They, don't, they no longer qualify for the visa waiver. Okay? So the 2015 law, what it did is it identified, actually it identified four countries, and then later the U.S. State Department added three more. That's not important. But identified these certain countries with high risk of terrorism, and said that anyone who has dual citizenship in one of those countries or who has recently traveled to one of those countries, they have to have a visa. They don't get to participate in the visa waiver, even if they have a British passport or a Canadian passport. So if somebody's Canadian, you know, they've got a Canadian passport, they're Canadian citizens, but they recently spent two weeks in Iraq. Maybe they went to two weeks in Iraq as a, like, for, um, you know, medical mission or something, or maybe they went two weeks in Iraq to be a t to a terrorist training camp, right? How do we know? So if they recently spent time in one of these seven countries, then even though they have a Canadian passport, if they want to come into the U.S., they have to get a visa. Okay, so they're now excluded from the visa waiver program. Everyone's pretty good there? Okay, I want you at your table, please, to describe what is the visa waiver program and how did the 2015 law change it with respect to those seven countries. Talk about it at your table. Go. To be honest, I don't know. I haven't looked at the law that closely. I don't think it's like, have you ever been there in your life? I think it is sometime in the past six months or the past year or whatever it is, but um, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. There's seven of them. I don't remember which one was the four that Congress identified and which were the three that were added later by the State Department, but the seven of them are listed on your paper. They're over here. Yes. Visas are, have a set amount of time on them. This is going a little bit beyond my expertise. So, um, but I do know that visas are given for a specific amount of time. So like you can get a student visa and it you know, expires in four years or in one year or whatever it is. So it depends. But sometimes you get a tourist visa for two weeks or something. So like it depends on what the visa said, how often they have to reapply for that. Okay, any questions about the visa waiver program or how the 2015 law changed it? Again, this is complicated. I really want you to ask because I promise you if you're confused, somebody else is as well. Are you feeling pretty good? Okay, so now let's talk about the executive order itself. So on January the 27th, the executive order, our President Trump issues his executive order. Um, I have a copy of it here. Let me see what it's called. Something about preventing... Uh, it's called Protecting the Nation from Foreign Terrorist Entry into the United States is the name of the executive order. Protecting the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States. Um, so it was, passed, uh, it was issued on January 27th. And we've talked about executive orders, right? 
They apply because it's over something the president has control over. The bureaucracy is in charge of immigration, of granting visas, of deciding who can enter the, you know, like the customs service is in charge of like accepting people in through airports or whatever. So because the president controls all of those things, he has uh, the authority to issue executive orders about immigration one way or the other. So of course, the first part of um, the executive order, President Trump says it's not a travel ban, but we're going to go with travel ban because it's pretty much a travel ban. Um, so is the travel ban from anyone who is a citizen or who has been to the seven countries? And the actual, the actual executive order does not name the countries. It just says the countries named in the 2015 law, right? So President Trump didn't, didn't pick these countries. He just said the countries that were named in the 2015 law. So what it says is anyone who's a citizen of those countries or who has traveled to those countries, like I'm a citizen of, you know, Italy, but I just traveled to Iraq, like for vacation or something, uh, whatever, <laughs> uh, mission trip, let's go with, then those people are barred from entering the U.S. And I want you to note that this includes people who have a valid visa. So a more realistic scenario, what if I'm a student, like say from Iran, and I have a student visa to attend Texas A&M University. There are many students um, at Texas A&M University who uh, come from these countries. So they have a stu there. Uh, they are, you know, I'm a I'm a citizen of Iran, but I have a valid existing student visa that allows me to study in te at Texas A&M. So I'm here legally. I have already been approved to come here. If I happen to, let's say, my mom in Iran was sick, and I happened to go home to Iran on January the 22nd, would I be allowed to re-enter the United States? No, because even though I have a visa, this bans all travel from citizens of or anyone who is recently, what if I'm a, a resident, what if I'm a, someone who, um, I'm a citizen of Italy who has a student visa to come to the U.S. and study here, but I just went on a mission trip over the Christmas holidays to Iraq, and I'm coming back to the United States on, the, on January 22nd, or 20, January 23rd, and I want to come back so I can go back to school. Can I do that? No. Even if I'm a citizen of some other country, but I've been to one of these seven countries that are named in the 2015 law, I can't come in. Now, there was a lot of confusion the very first day. Because the executive order wasn't super clear about, like, were there exemptions? Um, and so on the very first day, even people with green cards, they're, they're called lawful permanent residents, even people with green cards who were returning were not allowed to enter. They were detained in the airport and refused entry to the United States. But the very next day, on January the 28th, the Department of Homeland Security Department of Homeland Security, they clarified and they said that lawful permanent residents, that's people who have a green card, lawful permanent residents are exempt. So if you have a green card, then even if you have just traveled to one of those countries, you are allowed to re-enter the United States. It doesn't apply to you. But anyone who has a visa, again, a valid visa, but if all they have is a visa, they're not a lawful permanent resident, they may not re-enter the country for 90 days. This is not a permanent travel ban. It's supposed to last for 90 days. Which, if you're a student, you can say that would be a problem. So for 90 days. Yes? So people with green cards, like people with yeah, so U.S. citizens obviously can enter, can, are not affected by this ban. That would be an unconstitutional deprivation of your rights. Right, if you're not a citizen of the United States. So even if you're a citizen of a country we like, Italy, England, whatever, but you have been to those countries, you also can't come. Yes? So if you were a student and you, were, you went back to Iran or whatever, and you were like, for the Christmas holidays, and you came back and you were born in Christmas, did you lose your employment for loss of funds on your entity for your time on your institution? Well, interestingly, no. We're going to get to some of that legal precedent like when we get into the case. Um, but... Um, like, people with visas don't have constitutional rights. So, like, 
um, they don't get to say like like the the idea. It's an argument that's made in the brief that we're going to get on Monday from um, the President Trump's government. Um, but the argument is effectively that like a visa does not grant you special rights. It just says that you have permission, like that we've given you this permission to come, and that a visa doesn't mean admittance. Like if you get a visa, but then you show up here and we decide we don't want you, that you don't actually have any rights to. To the, so we have to let you, like, even if you have a visa, you don't have any rights to demand that. Like, so um, let's say we gave someone a visa, but then, um, and, you know, they book their plane tickets, they come here, but in the meantime, they're identified by some intelligence information as a security threat or as a drug dealer or whatever it is, then even though they have a valid visa, the U.S. government has the right to deny them entry when they get to the border, even if they have a visa in place. So, like, actually, people with visas don't have, they can't sue. Now, the lawful permanent residents, the green card holders who were detained, by accident or what in the confusion on the first day, they ha several of them have sued. Um, but mo because once they were released, they no longer have standing to sue, so it's over. Um, okay, so the Department of Homeland Security, they clarify, so that's the first part of the executive order, is this travel ban. But it's more than that, there's also the element of refugees. So um, the executive order first has a 120 day suspension of the refugee program. That means that for 120 days, for four months, we will not accept any refugees, zero refugees of any kind. No refugees can come in for this 120 days. Again, even if they've already been approved, they already have their paperwork, they already have their plane tickets, no refugees will be allowed for 120 days. Okay? And then it says that after the 120 days, and by the way, why is the 120 days, why the 90 days? The point is to give the president, the executive order says, the point is to give the government time to develop a better system of screening, to make sure that the refugees that are coming in or that the people who come in on travel, will, that we have a better way to screen them to make sure they're not bad guys, right? To clarify, to review, to improve our screening measures. So that's why these are temporary, right? It's supposed to just give some time to the U.S. government to figure stuff out. So 120 days, no refugees. Then when we do begin accepting refugees, we're going to cap the number of refugees at 50,000. So we will take only 50,000 per year. To give you some reference, um, under President Obama in 2016, we accepted about 110,000 refugees in one year, uh, about 80,000 refugees the year before that. Um, but by comparison, the country of Germany has accepted about 500,000 refugees each year um, for the past couple of years. So uh, it's a very small number, 50,000, especially when you consider how much bigger we are than Germany is. Um, right. Um, so 50,000 refugees per year. And then one more thing, that we have an indefinite ban on Syrian refugees. So we 120 days, and we'll begin accepting refugees from other countries. But until further notice, we will not accept any refugees from Syria at all. It's part of the executive order. Well, I mean, it doesn't say until he leaves office. It just says that until he decides. Like, so he could decide at 125 days that we can accept them. But it's just like until the president decides, we won't accept any from Syria. And then the last thing for the refugees, when we begin accepting refugees again, we're going to prefer or preferentially treat religious minorities. So if we're getting refugees from the Ukraine, for example, right, um, there are refugees coming from the Ukraine, all that unrest in Russia and Crimea and all that business. If, you know, so uh, the Ukraine, I think, is predominantly orthodox. Um, uh, and so, like, um, religious minorities from the Ukraine would be Muslims or Jews or whatever. So we would prefer refugees from the Ukraine who are religious minorities in the Ukraine. Um, but the... The thing is that in this, like in 2017, it just so happens that most countries that are sending, that have refugees fleeing them, uh, happen to be predominantly Muslim countries, which means that the effect of this preference for religious minorities would be to, to prefer against, to avoid Muslim refugees, right? Because most countries with refugee populations um, are predominantly Muslim, so we're going to be preferring non-Muslim um, refugees. This is one of the most controversial parts of the order, which we'll talk about when we get to the arguments of the brief on Monday. So um, we're going to prefer religious minorities when we do begin accepting refugees. Are there any questions about what the executive order says? 
So this is for 90 days, no one may come who is not a U.S. citizen or a green card holder may come to the United States from any of those countries or as a citizen of any of those countries, even if they have existing visas. So that's a travel ban, right? For 90 days, no travel from those countries or from citizens of those countries. Yes? No, not really. Um, so our existing refugee program does not have a particular, doesn't have an element of screening for religious, for like religious minority or otherwise. Yes. He could issue another executive order, yes. Well, probably, if I had to guess, I don't know the answer to that. But if I had to guess, I would say that, that like an indefinite ban is more likely to be challenged legally, or is harder to defend legally. That he can defend it if he says that the point, that, that there's a definite end to it, it's not infinite, um, and so on. Um, okay, any questions about the executive order? Any more questions? Okay, so now we're going to get into the timeline of what happened. So January 27th is when the executive order was issued. Um, on January the 30th, the state of Washington filed suit in district court. The state of Washington filed suit in district court. We're going to talk in a little while about what district court is, like what that means. But for now, the state of Washington filed suit in district court. So, uh, they actually filed two things. First, they filed a complaint um, arguing that the executive order is unconstitutional. You think it's unconstitutional. But somebody tell me, when I file a lawsuit, um, how long does it take before the hearing is held? Can we agree with a while? Yeah. Right, a while, right? So first I file the lawsuit, then we have to give some time for the other side to respond, and they, they, they submit a brief, and then there's going to be a period of something called discovery, where I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of research about to support my case, and they're going to be doing a whole bunch of research. And then after the period of discovery, then we're going to trade information. I have to give them everything I found. They give me everything they found. And then there's a little more, a lot more time while we like, go over what the other side found. And then we write a response to what they found. So now we write a new brief. And then we submit that to the court. And then the court takes all of that and establishes a day for a hearing. So they have to give the judge long enough time to review all that information and ask any questions they want to ask. So then they're going to schedule a hearing, and then the hearing will be held, and then we'll do the arguments, and then the judge will, will rule, right? So it'll be a while, right? It could be weeks or even months between filing a lawsuit and the actual hearing being heard. Nod your heads if you're with me. Okay. So as a result, the second thing that the, um, the state of Washington filed was an emergency request for a temporary restraining order, which is abbreviated TRO. So at the same time that they filed their actual lawsuit, hey, we think the executive order is unconstitutional, simultaneously, they also filed an, in the meantime, we really want a restraining order. And what the TRO would do, what a restraining order does, is stops the enforcement of the executive order, right? So what the state of Washington is saying, hey, we think this executive order is unconstitutional, and we want the court to forbid the president from enforcing it until we have a real hearing to decide whether or not the law is constitutional. Okay? So we're, we're contesting, Washington is contesting, they think the law is that the executive order is unconstitutional, and they want the judge to stop President Trump from enforcing it, meaning allow travel, allow refugees, etc., until they can have their time in court for the judge to decide, yes, it is constitutional, no, it's not. Everyone's with me? So far, we are all, like present day, we are only on this step. No hearing has been held over whether or not this law is constitutional. The district court is still, they're still waiting for briefs and discovery and evidence, all that information. So no one has had a hearing of any kind about whether or not this executive order is constitutional. But on February the 3rd, the district court granted the TRO. 
That means on February the 3rd, the district court in Washington said, yes, we will grant the TRO, we will forbid the president from enforcing this law or this executive order until we can have a full hearing. Kind of controversially, the TRO applied to the whole country, right? So that the executive order can't be enforced anywhere in the whole country um, while they're waiting. And the Trump administration thought that was, thinks that that's not fair. Because if the case is just about Washington State and Minnesota, then, um, then why should the, the TRO apply to the whole country? The judge's, law, the judge's reasoning was that let's say that I am a student with a student visa to go to Washington State University, and, um, but my flight lands in New York first. Well, if, if the TRO only applies to Washington State, then I will be banned from entering the country in New York and I wouldn't be able to get to Washington State. So the judge decided that the TRO had to be nationwide to, re to relieve the problems that, it was, that the Washington said it was causing. Okay. So on federal, uh, February 3rd, district court grants the TRO. But the U.S. government, President Trump, immediately appealed. He says, that's not fair. It's not okay to stop the order before you decide it's unconstitutional. Until the court says it's unconstitutional, I have every right, I, President Trump, have every right to enforce the order. Okay, so Trump's argument is the TRO is not valid, that, that we should not be able to stop its enforcement until such point as a court decides it's unconstitutional. So they appeal. Um, so then on February the 6th, the U.S. Circuit Court, and we'll talk in a little while about the difference between district court and circuit court. For now, just understand the circuit court's the next level up. It's like I'm the district court and Ms. Elder is the circuit court. So the, the U.S. Circuit Court who heard the appeal, right, the appeal went to the circuit court. If you don't like what I do, your parents are going to go yell at Ms. Elder about it. Um, so the circuit court heard the appeal. Remember, what are they appealing? A decision about the constitutionality? No, the, the constitutionality has not been considered yet, right? That's still, they're waiting for the process to, like, carry on. What has been appealed? The TRO, right? Whether or not this restraining order, this, like, halt on the executive order is okay. So just yesterday, the circuit court, which actually happens to be the Ninth Circuit Court, in case you're curious, the Ninth Circuit Court upheld the TRO. They ruled against President Trump's administration, and they said, no, we're not going to stop the TRO. Yes? Well, yes, but the person arguing the case is actually the Solicitor General, which is a different thing. But yes, that's true, but not necessarily. Okay, so just yesterday, like last night at like 5.30, the Ninth Circuit Court ruled that they will not, they will not stop the TRO, that the TRO will remain in effect. So currently speaking, right now, is the executive order being enforced? No, it is not being enforced. It was only enforced between January 27th and February the 3rd when the TRO was enacted. Since February the 3rd, the executive order has not been enforced because of an order of the district court. Okay. Now, um, any questions about that? Okay, um, let me pause the recording. Is that come for me? Sorry, I was checking my microphone. So, um, what we're going to talk about next um, is to consider the question of what are all these courts and like what are they doing. Um, so then Monday we're really going to get into the document that you have in front of you. But so I want to kind of clarify some vocabulary for you. So the U.S. federal court system is what we're talking about. And the federal court system applies only to federal law, right? So if you break a state law, like you um, commit a traffic violation or you commit murder, sometimes people, st students think that like federal laws are the more serious laws, but, but violent stuff is usually a um, state law. So if you commit murder, you're going to go through the state court system. That's not what we're talking about right now, although it works in a very similar way to the way the federal court system works. But if you commit a federal crime, or there's a question about federal law, then that's going to be heard in the federal court system. So that's what we're going to discuss. And there are three layers in the federal court system. The first layer is the district court. And there are about 100 of them in the country. Um, and they each have their own like little geographic region. Okay, So uh, our closest district court is in Houston. So if you commit a federal crime, like say that Kat assaults her mailman, 
That's a federal crime, by the way. He's a federal employee, so she commits a federal crime. Um, then her case would be heard in the Houston District Court, right? So you don't just get to pick any any district court in the whole country. Each district court has its own like area that it's in charge in of. Okay? Yes. Well, capital murder, the word capital just means that it's punishable by death. Um, and so the law would have, like, you'd have to see what the law said. But if she, if she, if you kill a federal employee, that is a federal crime. So the only kind of murder that's a federal crime is if you kill somebody protected by the federal government. Um, but like most murders that are capital murders are state crimes. Because like if you murder me in a way that qual qualifies you for the death penalty, then that's a capital murder. Uh, okay, so the district court, there's about a hundred of them, they're all across the country, um, and uh, they are some, they have something called original jurisdiction. Has anybody ever heard the word jurisdiction before? Do you know what that means? Yeah, it's like the authority that they have. Original jurisdiction, the word jurisdiction for a court means like what kinds of cases that can they hear? And original jurisdiction means that the courts that, ha that the district courts they can hear questions of fact. What does that mean? Questions of fact. Well, in Kat's case, her assault of the mailman or her alleged assault of the mailman, um, the questions of fact are: Did she do it or not? Right? Was she there? What is the evidence? Were those marks that we photographed on her hands bruises or ink stains? Um, when the mailman identified her, did you know, or identified her in a lineup? Did he think that she was the person who assaulted him, or the person who like came to help him? Whatever it is, like we're deciding the facts of the case at the original court level, at the district court level. Um, with respect to our case about the um, executive order, the fact of the case is going to be: Does this executive order violate the the um, Constitution or not? Right. Um, so that's what they're going to be deciding at the district court level. Has the district court decided on questions of fact at this point? No, they have not, right? It's been appealed to them, but they haven't had the case yet. All they've done is they've granted an emergency TRO. That's the only thing that's been litigated to this point. So far, the case about the questions of fact is still in the works right now. But let's say that Kat is found guilty, but she knows that she's not guilty because she totally didn't do it. So she can appeal her case. And the next level of the federal courts is the circuit courts. There are 13 circuit courts in the whole United States, so significantly fewer circuit courts, right? There are 13 of them, and each of them has its own geographical area. In Texas, we are under the fifth circuit court, which is in New Orleans, like the physical court building is in New Orleans. Um, so we're under the fifth circuit court. Um, so she can appeal to the circuit court, but the circuit court does not have original jurisdiction. They have something called appellate jurisdiction. And courts with appellate jurisdiction, they cannot decide questions of fact. They literally do not have the authority to decide whether or not Kat is guilty. Sometimes I think we get, there's this misconception that you hear about, you know, somebody who's found guilty and they say, I'm going to appeal. And we think that, like, when they appeal, they're going to, like, get retried and found not guilty or, you know, something. But that's not how it works. The appeals court cannot consider questions of fact. All they can do is consider questions of law. Was the law followed properly? For example, maybe um, the person that Katerina assaulted or is accused of assaulting um, was a male man but was off duty. So, like, was not protected at that time by a federal law. So, like, actually she should have been charged under state law instead of federal law or whatever. So, questions of law or procedure. When I stopped and questioned Katerina about the assault and noticed the, you know, colored markings on her hands that I think are bruises, did I have probable cause to stop her or reasonable suspicion or did I not? Um, in the, when the lineup was conducted for the mailman to pick out their attacker, did the police officer stand next to him and say, hey, isn't it that girl in the middle? Isn't it her? You know, did he bias the lineup? Did they make a mistake in procedure? Those are the only things the circuit court can find. So if Cat appeals, maybe she thinks that I didn't have reasonable suspicion to talk to her in the first place or whatever. All the circuit court can do is either find that, I, that, that somebody made a mistake in procedure, and if they do, let's say that the circuit court says, yeah, you screwed up, you know, court, district court, you, um, you know, they, they biased the lineup, then what? Katerina is officially not guilty and free to go? No. Retrial without that evidence, right? 
So the circuit court does not decide questions of fact. It does not decide yes or no, guilty or not guilty, constitutional or unconstitutional. It's only going to look at questions of procedure. That's why last night when the circuit court made their ruling about whether or not the TRO could stand, they weren't ruling on whether they would have given a TRO or whether they think there should be a restraining order. They were ruling, they, all they were doing was basically checking the district court's homework. Did the district court follow all the right procedures and rules? Or did the district court overstep their authority or do something wrong or take into consideration facts that should not have been included or whatever? That's all the circuit court can rule on. Questions of law or procedure. Um, so let's say the circuit court said, you know, they, they, don't, they, um, they find against Katerina. They say that law and procedure was found fine, that nothing was a problem with the district court's work. Katerina has one last hope. What is it? The U.S. Supreme Court, it's usually abbreviated SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States. There's also POTUS and FLOTUS, President of the United States and First Lady of the United States, which is just kind of fun. So uh, there's the Supreme Court, but I have some bad news for Katerina. Um, every single case that gets appealed from district court gets heard by the circuit court, every single one of them. But every year, about 10,000 cases are appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States, and they only hear somewhere between 90 and 100 of them each year. So the vast majority of cases appealed to the Supreme Court are not chosen by the Supreme Court, which means if Katerina appeals to the Supreme Court and they don't take her case, what decision stands? Whatever the district court said, right? The district court decisions, or not the district court, sorry, I messed you up. The circuit court stands. The last court decides, right? So if she appeals from the circuit court, it's going to stand. All right, that's perfect for us to end. Um, if you will just give me one more second of your time. No, this. this